for Ooh, recording. Awesome. Okay. Uh, uh, before I jump into the meat of the talk itself, uh, I do like to start with a content warning uh, because this talk, we're going to talk about some heavy things, war, near-death experiences, medical crises, terrorism, natural disasters. Uh, these are topics that some people find difficult. Please know that every story that is going to be shared here today is shared with the intention to teach. It is my hope that by examining the crises of the past, that designers can better support people into the future. All right. So uh, the first story I have for you today is about somebody you may have heard of, Neil Armstrong. Before Armstrong took the very first steps on the moon, he was a young hotshot fighter pilot for the U.S. Navy. And he flew one of these, an F-9F Panther fighter jet. Now, this is the Korean War, so we're talking the 1950s. He's like early 20s. So he is out on a mission and in the midst of a deadly dogfight when half of his right wing gets sheared off by an anti-aircraft cable. Now, through some truly spectacular flying, he is actually able to keep his plane in the air, but it's only his high rate of speed that is keeping him aloft. He knows if he slows down at all, he's going to go into an uncontrolled roll and crash, which means obviously he cannot land his plane. So he gets on to the, um, you know, the radio with his CO and what they decide he should do is to fly back toward the U.S. base, eject out near the, the fields near the base and just let his plane crash into the ocean. So that's what he heads out to do. So he turns his plane in that direction. Now, as he is flying back towards base he realizes he has only had the most very basic training in the ejection seat for this particular model of plane that he is currently flying. So what does Armstrong do? He pulls out the manual. Yeah, the guy reads the instructions while flying a broken plane through enemy territory. <laughs> And by God, he pulls it off. This is actually a picture of Armstrong. He's holding the D ring of his parachute there in his right hand. He's standing in a rice paddy just outside of the uh, US base there. So I love this story. Uh, it is buck wild to me that this guy has the chill required to read the instruction manuals in this sort of situation. Now, as a designer who has studied the intersection of stress and design for the last few years, when I heard this story, the thing that I wanted to know is, what was the design of those instructions? What did those instructions look like? Now, I was actually able to dig up a copy of that manual. So this is the page from the F9F Panther uh, fighter jet manual. Um, and this is a fantastic piece of crisis design. It does everything that the research says that you should do when you are designing something to be used in a high stress situation. Uh, first of all, it's uh, got this nice singular linear set of instructions that starts with a very clear call to action, reduce airspeed if possible, and then just goes straight down in a numbered list down the page. It's got uh, lots of short phrases, uh, short words, and a mix of images and words that's also been said to help. It also has this fantastic use of color. So that red color that is uh, you know, on each of these illustrations, it really draws your eye to the most important part of illustration. So they really are taking advantage of that two-tone printing that they had in the 50s uh, to really get the most out of the illustrations that they have. There is so much that designers can use from pieces of what I might call crisis design, right? Uh, there's so much that we can use from pieces like this to inform any time that we are designing for people who are in stressful states. So stress is the topic that I wanna talk about uh, with you today. So in some ways, stress is a great unifier, right? Like every creature on the planet experiences it. And stress changes humans. It changes the way we move, it changes the way we behave, and it changes the choices that we make, especially in those critical moments. And so as designers, it's critical for us to understand how does it change human behavior, especially if we are hoping to influence that human behavior in those moments of high stakes, high stress moments. Now, we're going to look at uh, examples, like the example we just looked at from high stakes, high stress 
industries where the intersection of stress and design has been incredibly well studied. I'm thinking medical, uh, aviation, uh, military, uh, but there are lessons from these industries that can be taken and applied to all sorts of types of designs, no matter, because I know we don't all, you know, we don't all design for, for fighter pilots. So there are lessons that can be applied to all sorts of situations. Maybe you design for a group of people uh, that have, you know, other types of high stress jobs like day traders or customer service reps, right? Like that, those are some of the most stressful jobs on the planet. Um, or maybe you are designing just one feature and a product that is being being intended to be used after a moment of high stress, like following uh, a car accident, or maybe you design stuff that really shouldn't be stressful at all. But nevertheless, you know, the world is today what it is, and people are coming to your designs in a stressed out state of mind. Uh, now, the good news is uh, if a stressed out person can use your design, anyone can. So the things that we're going to talk about today are only going to make your designs easier to use. So there are four main approaches I want to talk to you about today for designing for the human stress response. Now, in some cases, you can harness that response. An adrenaline rush is a powerful force of nature, and a smart design can actually put it to use in a critical moment. Uh, in other cases, you're going to want to suppress it, either decreasing it or avoiding it altogether. If you're unable to accomplish those first two, then you're going to want to think about how to protect your users. If panic is set in, they probably can't protect themselves. They're not in the right mental state. So then it becomes our responsibility. And finally, calm. You can craft your experiences and products to comfort users after a stressful back event and help them get back into a place where they can be their best selves again. Okay, let's start by looking at some specific examples, starting with harnessing the amazing human potential that is often unlocked in a moment of crisis. Uh, some people call these dad reflexes. Now, dad reflexes is a popular meme. Uh, if you Google it, you will find hundreds of examples of dudes saving their offspring from terrible injury or certain death through purely reflexive reactions. Now, you might think that parenthood's about unlocks some superpowers in these guys, but the fact of the matter is it was always in them. These are reflexes that are waiting inside each of us. But how do we as designers and product creators, how, how do we harness these superpowers? Well, first we have to understand under what types of circumstances our reflexes are actually helpful. So as of the 2012 games, the Olympics no longer used these starter pistols to signal the start of the race. And this is in part because researchers at the University of Alberta proved that runners who were right next to the starter pistol got an unfair advantage. Their startle reflex, that bang of the opening starting gun, helped them get off the starting block an average of 18 milliseconds faster than runners who were further away. Now, that's not much. A millisecond is one one thousandth of a second. But in the world of high performance sports, that can be the difference between silver and gold. Now, it's important to note that not all types of movement is increased by a startle reflex, okay? So in a study comparing the speed movements for arms versus fingers, they showed that the speed boost shows up for the movement. You can see in the left that those times are getting lower and lower as the startle is introduced. But in the finger study, triggering the startle reflex has no benefit, but time flatlines. And in fact, the stiffness uh, in the fingers actually decreases the accuracy of the movement. And that's because the startle reflex is great for helping us with gross motor movements, doing things like run and punch, fight or flight, right? But it actually makes it harder to do things like clicking tiny buttons because it is stealing resources from your fine motor skills to pump up your gross motor skills. So these sorts of distinctions is really critical information if you're creating something that may need to be used by someone who is under extreme stress. Uh, if you want to create an interface that harnesses the benefits of human stress response while acknowledging the realities of our human limitations in those moments. Now, there are some tried and true designs that we can borrow from. So the emergency stop button is a great example of an interface that harnesses that human stress response. First of all, it's big right? It's got that unique mushroom headed shape. It protrudes up over the panel, right? This is a button that is made to be slapped like you are in a game show. It's taking advantage of that gross motor improvement. 
It's also highly standardized. It's the standardization that makes interfaces intuitive. Now, this is so well standardized in factories all around the world that it has actually led to the color red being intuitively linked with the concept of stop in countries pretty much around the world. Um, it, even in countries like China, where red has other strong cultural implications, it is also strongly associated with the color stop. And it's actually because of this very button. Um, now, the other thing that it has going for it is that it is a physical control. Uh, if you mostly design for screens, I'm sorry to tell you, physical controls do outperform uh, screen-based controls in almost all cases uh, when it comes to emergency situations. But that doesn't mean that we can't improve the functionality and performance of digital interfaces uh, in times of emergency, because we can borrow what works about those physical controls and put them into our digital interfaces. For instance, you know, if you've got a button uh, that somebody might be trying to use on your interface in an emergency or, a, you know, a startled state, you can uh, increase the button size and surround it with like a large uh, area all around the button. So that really large margin for air, uh, sort of borrowing what works in the physical space and I'm applying it to the digital space. Uh, you, when you're thinking about ways to harness, you, you also might want to think about ways to maximize the intuitiveness of your designs. We talked a little bit about that already, uh, but intuitive design is really the golden compass for designing for stressful situations. Now in the medical field, this is a problem that they have recently tackled because the vast majority of medical alarms sound like this just an electronic beep, okay? Now these beeps are played with different patterns and pitches and they're supposed to mean different things, but it has been shown empirically that medical staff can rarely tell the difference between one alert sound and another. And it's actually their overuse that have prevented them from gaining any inherent meaning. A critical level alarm sounds every 90 seconds in a medical uh, environment. So this constant bar barrage of meaningless beeps leads to alarm fatigue, and that has been linked to hundreds of patients' deaths. And finally, after a study in 2013 revealed the scope of the pro problem, uh, the medical community put out a call to the design community asking for help. And designers and researchers around the world have teamed up to try to address this problem. Now they're attacking it from all sorts of angles. Some are looking to reduce the number of alarms. Some are coordinating alarms across devices. But one of my favorite solutions is uh, some work led by Dr. Judy Edworthy. She was called the godmother of alarm designs by the New York Times. And she led a team that began experimenting with creating more intuitive auditory signals. Um, instead of a endless, meaningless barrage of beeps, these what they, what they call sound icons, what they did, they took sounds from everyday life and they paired them with an associated medical concept. For instance, the sound of a rising tea kettle might tell you that your patient's temperature is getting too high. That might sound something like this. I'm going to play that one more time. Uh, and if your patient's medical, uh, I'm sorry, if there's something wrong with your patient's medicine, they might use the sound of a rattling pill bottle uh, to signal uh, issues with medication. And then there's this one. I'm pretty sure that that means the Death Star is attacking. Pretty sure. So... <laughs> Their research showed such a stark improvement in medical staff's ability to understand, learn, and respond to the sound icons that the International Committee has recently adopted these sound icons as international standards for medical devices around the world. Now, res response time to these icons is 20% faster than other beep-based alarms because they are so inherently intuitive. People hear them, immediately understand, and can immediately take action as opposed to having to you know, check a monitor to see what's going on. This is a great example of harnessing that stress response. Okay, so you know that's all well and good, but I do have to admit, uh, usually when we think about designing for stress, we're thinking about ways to reduce it 
or to suppress it. Now, one of the ways that you can suppress the stress response is through training. Now, this is a specialty of our U.S. military. They have dumped billions of dollars into figuring out the most effective types of training to get the peak performance out of soldiers, even in high stress situations. Now, these techniques can be used to develop training materials for anyone in high or low stress jobs. Uh, but to create effective trainings, it is important to understand the different ways that people learn. So when you learn something in a classroom setting or a conference like this, you're mostly learning that fact in your analytical mind. You're engaging your prefrontal cortex. Uh, this is a type of learning that is unique to humans. We can learn how to do something simply by hearing a story about something some other idiot did and learn not to do that thing ourselves. Now, the other way that humans learn is to actually do the thing, right? This is how most creatures learn. They learn through doing. And when we learn something this way, it gets logged in the prefrontal cortex, but it also gets logged in the hippocampus. Now, the hippocampus sits right in the center of our heads, just above our spinal cord. It's in the midbrain. And, and because these memories live in our midbrain, they are very close to our primal core. Now, something interesting happens in our bodies and our brains uh, during a stressful event. So uh, we talked a little bit about when there's an adrenaline rush, um, the, the, it steals resources from the extremities, from your fingers and pulls it in. It's actually the blood moves and it pulls the oxygen in towards your gross motor skills. So, you know, super powering for running and jumping. Now the same thing is happening in our brains. The blood and oxygen from the extremities where things like our prefrontal cortex are located right in the front of our foreheads, it gets pulled back into the center of our brains, into our midbrain. And the effect of this is that our intuition in these moments, that, that experiential memory that makes up our intuition, that gets a megaphone in moments of high stress, while our logic and reason gets really hard to hear. So this is an effect that some soldiers call the fog of war. And it is why it is so important that these soldiers are trained about when to shoot or more importantly, when not to shoot while they are on their feet, often with a weapon in their hand. That is how the training gets logged into the right parts of the brain so they can actually access it when they need it in those moments of high stress. Now, anyone who creates training, anybody, um, if you're trying to get somebody to, to, to use your product or perform well in a high stress situation, you can borrow the things that work uh, around these trainings. So obviously hands-on is critical. You also want lots of repetition and you want a lot of fast feedback. This is actually why digital simulators are actually very effective at training. Um, and especially as these digital simulators get more and more realistic, because realism is actually a, a critical component of, of uh, of the training as well. The, it's actually a good thing to get some like the heart pumping during a training like this and have people be a little stressed, uh, even in the training situation. Cause if they are learning something in that mental state, they'll be able to access those memories when they are in that mental state again. Now, when we are creating trainings, we do need to think really carefully about what are we training into people? Uh, now I hope you've all gone through CPR training because CPR has been shown to double or even triple somebody's chance for surviving a heart attack. Now, if you have gone through CPR training, you've most likely used a dummy that looked something like this. It's one of the most popular uh, CPR mannequin uh, training devices on the market. Now, I'm going to share a statistic with you, and let's see if you can figure out what this CPR dummy is missing. Okay, the stat is 45% of men receive CPR from bystanders, while only 39% of women will receive CPR from a stranger. So what is this dummy missing? The answer is boobs. This mannequin has no breasts. To properly administer CPR to a woman, you are supposed to rip open her shirt and put your hand directly over her left breast. Now, some people fear that they will be seen to be doing something inappropriate and it holds them back from taking action 
um, they are unsure. They've never trained for this exact situation and it feels wrong. Of course, that is their intuition speaking, right? If we think about it logically, of course, from an ethical standpoint, it's more important to save a woman's life than to protect her modesty. But it is not logic and reason at the forefront in those moments. It is intuition and it feels wrong. And so people hesitate, they freeze. So to tackle this problem, the creative team at Joan, working with a group called the United State of Women, they developed Well Mannequin. It is a low cost wrap that can be easily added to a flat chested CPR dummy. Now this gives trainees a chance to learn proper technique, get over their discomfort, ask questions in the classroom. Is this really okay? Yes, they, they can be assured it really is okay. Uh, and ultimately be empowered to save more people's lives. If you are responsible for creating training programs or material, think really carefully about the bias that might be lurking in that training because biases only get stronger when people are under stress. But hands-on training is one of the best ways to retrain that bias into powerful, helpful intuition. So you can use it. Okay. Now, sometimes... There just aren't ways to harness the stress response or to suppress it. Sometimes things get really bad and people panic. And panic strips us of our cognitive abilities. It reduces our ability to think clearly. I had read lots of studies about this phenomenon, but honestly, it didn't hit home to me until I talked to a friend of mine who shared something that had happened to her. And, and this story really brought it home to me. So she was at home. She was cleaning her house. Uh, it was a nice summer day. She's home with her two little boys and her youngest son is following her around the house. She goes upstairs. She's cleaning the bedroom. She pops out of the bedroom just for a second and comes back into the room and the room is empty and the screen is no longer on the window. She said, I knew exactly what had happened. She rushed over to the window, she looks down and her son is lying still on the pavement two stories below. She starts screaming his name. She runs down the stairs. She grabs the cordless phone on her way through the kitchen. She goes to him, she kneels down and he is breathing, but he is otherwise not responding to her. And she looks down at the phone in her hand and her fingers are so stiff, she can barely hold it. And she's looking at the phone and she told me, I will never forget this. She told me, Katie, I couldn't find the nine. She couldn't even see it among the other numbers. So about this time, her older son had heard her screaming and he came over to find out what was going on. And so she holds out the phone to him and she says, you have to do it. You have to call 911. It was her eight-year-old son who called the ambulance and saved his brother's life that day. Now, this story has a happy ending. The kid had a total full recovery. He is totally fine. That happened like 12 years ago. The kid's about to go off to college. He's totally fine. <laughs> but every time I tell this story, it brings home to me just how much we lose in those moments, the, the, the skills that we have built, the knowledge that we have gained, that we rely upon to help us in, a, in our greatest moment of need, they're just stripped from us. Now, the neurochemical that is responsible for this. Who is responsible for this? Cortisol. Cortisol is responsible for this. So the cortisol, now I don't mean to give cortisol a bad name. Cortisol is an incredibly important neurochemical. It is literally what brings us to wakefulness in the morning. Like we would not get out of bed if it wasn't for cortisol. It's what wakes us up. It, it rises in our bloodstream and wakes us up in the morning. So cortisol is incredibly important. It is a driving chemical. It drives us to take action, to get out of bed, to make decisions, to, to get it done, to save the day, right? But it pushes us. It pushes us to always be making faster decisions. Now that means that those decisions are less well considered. It also pushes us towards black and white thinking, which makes it hard to think creatively when we reach a, a peak moment of stress. It reduces our ability to learn and understand things, and it reduces our ability to retain the things that we do learn. And finally, it increases aggression, especially against people who we see as outside of our tribe, our personal tribe, right? However, we're defining it in that moment. 
which makes it harder to listen to reason and, and to accept help when we might need it. So overall, especially once it reaches a, a creek point, a, a peak point, cortisol really reduces our ability to make good decisions. So how is designers, how do we help with this, right? How, how do we help people in these moments? Well, I actually talked to a woman who thinks a lot about this, Jackie Wolf. She is a UX uh, researcher at Michigan Medicine. She's the one in front in plaid there in that photo. So Jackie thinks about this a lot. She, she um, uh, was actually approached by a researcher at the Michigan Medicine. M Michigan Medicine is a, is a research hospital. So they actually do quite a bit of research. I um, mean, she was approached by a doctor in her group who had done a survey with parents of children who had cancer, who had been enrolled in a phase three clinical trial at the hospital. Now this survey came back with some concerning results. Only 50% of the parents who were surveyed could explain the goal of the trial that their child was enrolled in. 66% were unaware that they had an alternative to agreeing to be in the trial. I guess they just thought their kid wouldn't get treated if they said no, I don't know. And then Fully one in five did not even realize their child was enrolled. Hmm. So to understand how something like this could happen, it's critical to think about the experience of these parents. Okay, so when a child is first diagnosed with cancer, those first 48 hours are a whirlwind. Usually the parents have been in the hospital for days on end. They are exhausted, they are sleep deprived, and they have just heard one of the scariest pieces of news a parent can ever hear that their kid has cancer. It is in this state where their brains are practically soaking in cortisol, it's in the state that they are approached by clinicians and asked, would you consider enrolling your child in a phase three clinical trial? And it has to be, that decision has to be made before treatment begins, right? So that's how trials work. So at most they'll get one night to review a dense and highly technical 30 page consent disclosure agreement. And then that decision has to be made. Now, Clinical trials like these have taken the survival rate of childhood leukemia from 35% to nearly 90% in the last 50 years. Obviously the upside for humanity is great, but would you sign up your sick child for an experiment? Ooh, I mean, that is a difficult, um, it's, it's a difficult decision to make. And from an ethical standpoint, it is critical that parents understand what it is that they are agreeing to. So now enter Jackie's team. They have created a tool to give, they have to create a tool to give terrified sleep deprived parents a proper crash course in phase three clinical trials. <laughs> so uh, what a phase three trial means is that they are studying small changes to a standard treatment. Okay. There is no placebo in, in, in studies like this. Every child will get a treatment. So after a child is diagnosed, um, they're asked if they will enroll them in the trial. If the parent says yes, they are randomly placed in one of two arms of an experiment. Either they'll get the standard treatment or they'll get a standard treatment with a small little change. They are looking for a one or 2% a, you know, improvement, uh, sometimes just a reduction in side effects. Now, if the parent says no, that is perfectly fine. And the kid will still get the standard treatment. Now, I just explained this uh, phase three trials. I just explained this to you using a chart that Jackie and her team actually designed. This is the original chart that was shown to parents to explain the procedure. So you can see, you can see the problem here, right? So Having this as a starting point and knowing how important this work was, uh, when Jackie first set out to tackle this design challenge, um, she turned to an old friend for help, the libraries. She hit the stacks and looked at all the available research to her. And when you work at a research hospital, that is a lot of available research. And she and her colleagues came up with several uh, core principles that really guided the work. Well, one of the first things they found was that it really didn't matter the medium. So video, print, digital, they all actually performed equally well in learning and retention, uh, at least when learning about clinical trials. Um, now, what did help was if something was interactive. So even turning pages or just clicking through items uh, rather than possibly uh, passively watching helped uh, increase retention levels. They also shot, found showing a mix of words and visuals really helped, just like the manual at the beginning. Um, they found breaking up content into bite-sized chunks helped and having 
a human lens, so a conversational tone and having characters uh, as part of the teaching materials that the, that the viewer could relate to, those all helped um, with understanding and learning and retention. So Jackie and her team put all of these insights together and they came up with what I think is a pretty clever solution. They created comics. So they broke out the, uh, they storyboarded out a conversation between parents and a doctor and, and put it into a comic book format. Now this really puts to use all of the research they found. It chunks out the information. It uses conversational tone. Uh, it's interactive because the users are clicking through each panel. It has characters and those characters are actually purposefully drawn in a way that invites readers to project themselves onto those characters. So when you have an in-depth understanding of human behavior under stress, you can create thoughtful, effective experiences like this that make the best possible impact on the people that you are designing for. Okay, finally, we are at calm. Now, oftentimes people turn to technology in the immediate aftermath of a crisis. When designing process, products used in these moments, not only do we want to help people take effective action, but we also want to think about ways to calm them down and get them back to their best selves. So let's look for a moment at the science of calming down. Like, What does that even look like in our brains and bodies? So even though cortisol and adrenaline are dumped into our bloodstreams in milliseconds, they have to be filtered out of our blood by our kidneys and our livers. And just like if you'd taken drugs or alcohol, and this can take anywhere from 20 minutes to hours. And these chemicals, they continue to affect people's behavior throughout the recovery period. And we've talked about these effects, poor decision-making, reduced cognition, increased aggression. But the good news is there are design choices that can help to minimize this recovery period. And some of them are as simple as just aesthetic changes. So an MRI study showed that adding more softness and curves into design can have a calming effect on the brain. It can be something as simple as just rounding the corners on the boxes and buttons that you use or using gentle gradients on colors. The brain also craves order and clarity when stressed and designs that feature regular predictable patterns can help calm users um, and help them feel more in control. And now in other circumstances, pulling in natural design elements can be very calming. Humans have evolved with a deep connection to nature and countless studies have demonstrated that views of nature can lower blood pressure, speed healing after an injury, reduced productivity and focus in the workplace. I mean, the list goes on and on. These elements can all collectively um, help reduce cognitive load and, and increase calm in the event, uh, in, the, in the wake of a stressful event. So as designers and creators, we may not be the ones on the front lines. We aren't the heroes fighting the wars or the doctors trying to stem the spread of a pandemic or the astronauts venturing outside the safety of our little blue marble. But if we craft our experiences carefully and mindfully, we can be there for people when they need us most. We can help calm them, we can protect them, and we can help them harness the full potential inside them, helping them to do truly amazing things. All right. That is what I've got for you guys today. Now, I know a lot of you out there are nerds like me and you love homework. So uh, feel free to take a screenshot of this slide. Uh, this can be your homework and additional readings coming out of here today. These are some of the sources uh, that uh, are some of my favorite sources that I use to create the talk today. Uh, also uh, used these sources and many, many others to write a book on this topic. As Carmelina mentioned uh, at the beginning, I uh, did write a book on this topic. Uh, there is a 15% uh, discount code there, Katie15. Uh, you, you can use that at rosenfeldmedia.com. Those are, that's my uh, publisher's website. That QR code will take you there. Uh, so if you wanna learn more or read the full book, you can do so uh, at the Rosenfelds uh, site. So I'll stop sharing my screen. I don't know, I know we're, Thanks, uh, I don't know Katie. if we have any time left for our questions, but I'd be happy to take Yeah, them. of course. And thank you so much. Oh my gosh, what an amazing, very, very different talk. So thank you. <laughs> it was awesome. And Leslie, I think we have you on to ask a few questions from in the chat. If anyone has questions, please put them in the chat. We're going to have somebody kind of looking over the questions and then we can field them over to Katie. Yes. Yeah. Thanks, Katie, for that incredible talk. 
I have yeah. family in healthcare, so I understand the type of stressors that they face, especially in new technology today. Yeah. So um, I think with a question that we have, um, so how would you test products with people under stress? Great question. It's actually one of the, the questions I get the most often uh, after this talk, because people are like, okay, this is all great, but how do you test it? And thank you also for asking that question, because uh, uh, you do want to test this. So there's a couple of really interesting things I ran into uh, in my research for the book. Um, you know, if you've got a big budget, if you work at a big corporation, you can do something like Ford did. They they created this whole dome. So they created a dome with 360 screens on it that is big enough to put a car inside. And so they would run tests. So they do things like um, they would uh, have a driver, like a, a test participant come in as a driver for hours and hours. And they would just have them um, uh, drive this car within this dome. It's up on hydraulics. So they've got all sorts of like, uh, you know, uh, multi-sensory feedback. And then they just have them drive for hours until they started to get sleepy. And then the, the test runners, they would like push a button and a deer would like leap out in front of the car to like test their reaction time, you know, and like, and how they reacted to it. So that, that was one of my favorite sort of like high budget ways to, to test things like a stress response. Um, but of course not everybody works with, you know, Ford money. Um, so, uh, one of the other really interesting, uh, test methods I heard, um, was I was interviewing some guys who worked at a, um, company that designs medical devices and their medical devices are sometimes used by like soldiers in war zones or, or you know medical staff in war zones and so they had a sample OR room set up it was pretty basic um, uh, and some dummies that that they were using and uh, they would have uh, people test their devices while they were pumping sounds of war zones into their fake OR uh, lab. And so uh, the use of sound is, um, it, it really is, is an interesting and effective way to stir up the stress response. We uh, use sound to warn us of danger, you know, unlike eyes where it's very direction focused, sound is, you know, 360, right? Uh, you, you can hear sound coming at you from all over. And so we use it, um, uh, it it's tied really closely into our intuition and, and we use it um, to, to guide us in, in moments of stress. And so we respond uh, to loud noises, um, you know, low rumbles, those sorts of noises can really trigger our stress responses. And it's a safe way to sort of raise somebody's stress level in a testing situation. Now, I will say uh, as a caveat, it's really important to be mindful and ethical when recruiting for um, uh, tests where you are going to be specifically stressing people out. Be sure that you are screening well for people with conditions like PTSD, where it may be re-traumatizing for them to experience stressful situations. Um, also be uh, you know, don't ask somebody to relive a trauma, a past trauma, unless it's really going to have um, a, a, a true effect um, on on uh, the design of your your uh, your product. Uh, can, if it's something that you are considering doing, uh, maybe consider creating some sort of ethics board, similar to what they do at universities, research universities, to sort of say, you know, is is the payoff worth the stress that we are putting the participants under? You know, is, is the benefits to humanity sort of weighed correctly? And, and are there the right sorts of ethical um, uh, uh, structures and, and supports afterwards to help people who might be um, traumatized through, through testing procedures? Yeah, thank you. I love that. And for that caveat, I think that's really important, which yeah. brings us to the next question. How do researchers consider uh, the ethics of stressing participants out? And that's by Jules Hare. Yeah, I, I, I mean, I, I, you know, I think I, I tried to cover that, you know, like when I, whenever I talk about researching for stress, I think, you know, making sure that we're thinking about those ethics. So I, I always really encourage um, the creation of a, of a governing body of some kind. I mean, that can be done within a corporation. Um, you know, maybe if you're, you work at a corporation that has a collaboration with some sort of academic association, maybe you can, you know, sort of do collaboration of some kind, um, uh, you know, trying to, to figure out, um, you, you know, luckily designers and researchers, usually we 
you know, we take this stuff pretty seriously and, and there's a lot of resources uh, out there to help us do so. So, you know, forming a body that, that whose job it is to make sure that we're taking care of our participants. I, I think that's probably one of the best ways to do it and making sure that that board is filled with diverse voices, right? So that you don't just have one type of person with one type of background making that decision, that it's, it, you've got a, a wide range of people with a wide range of experiences uh, in, in, as part of that board as well. I love that. Um, next question, how did your book, how did you start your book? <laughs> yeah, so um, the book actually started as the talk. The talk was the genesis of the book. Um, I, uh, I I was a theater major, actually, gr uh, growing up. Uh, I, I was originally in theater, if you can't tell from my, you know, sort of jazz hands that, that come out every once in a while when, when I'm speaking. Um, and so I do have like the performance bug, right? And I've, I've since gone into, you know, corporate uh, creative field, uh, but I do still like to get up on stage and, you know, the applause is lovely. So um, I have used that, that sort of drive within myself to direct my, and, and motivate me on my learning path. Cause you know, I could just say, oh, I want to read these 12 books by the end of the year. It would never happen. But if I have to get up on stage and talk about a topic in front of 500 people, you can bet I'm going to read those 12 books um, so that I am prepared and ready to, to represent. So, um, so I had been using that. I'd done two or three different talks before this, spoken at South by Southwest several times. Um, and so I was creating this talk uh, for hopefully, you know, South by Southwest number three, uh, spoiler alert, I did get in, woohoo. Um, but uh, so I was, I was creating this talk and oh my gosh, there's just, it's such a rich area of research. And I was having so much fun learning. Um, and, uh, and I, I was like, there's way more than a 45 minute talk here. And I just happened to be at a conference where I ran into Rosenfeld Media uh, they had a, a, they call it the bookmobile and they go to a lot of UX conferences and I had run into them and um, just went up randomly to the woman who was running the booth and said, Hey, I'm sure you get this all the time, but I have an idea for a book. And it just happened to be their managing edi editor, M Marta Jenkins. So like I... <laughs> I ended up talking to their managing editor and she was like, have you ever written a book before? And I was like, no. And she's like, it's hard. <laughs> like, like you might want to, you might want to like write a sample chapter, write a, a sample, you know, table of contents. So I did all that. I just went home and I just started writing. I wrote a sample chapter. It was 10,000 words. Like a chapter should be like 3000 to 5,000 words. You know, I didn't know. I just like went for it. Um, and so, but I sent them a writing sample and, and they have just like a one, a really simple, uh, one page form and I filled it out and, um, uh, it took about six months, but they finally got back to me and said, Hey, we're interested in this. Um, I had originally looked at writing it specifically for designers who design in high stress, high stakes fields, and they wanted me to broaden that. So the actual title of my book is Life and Death Design, What Life-Saving Technology Can Teach Everyday UX Designers. And so, you know, it was really about taking these uh, lessons from these high stakes, high stress fields and applying them to all sorts of designs. And they really helped me expand that. And I, I really think it was a strong positioning for the book. I'm really glad I got that direction from them. Uh, and they helped me through the process. It probably was about three years from sort of that first, um, well, from my first application, like when I sent in my application to um, to it getting on to bookshelves and an Amazon for sale on Amazon. Um, but and almost all of that happened during the pandemic. Um, I signed the contract to start writing. Um, I signed it in January of 2020. I was supposed to start writing March 15th. 2020. And uh, we all know what happened in March of 2020. Uh, I was supposed to have two, two weeks, right? We're, we're supposed to keep our kids home from school for two weeks. Yeah. <laughs> you know, like, like that. two weeks so, or two years. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so, so yeah, almost the whole thing was written during the pandemic, which gave a really interesting, uh, uh, you know, point of view on it, but it was a amazing yeah. experience and I'm really glad I did it. Awesome. Thank you so much, Katie. And a round of applause for Katie. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you so much for joining us. Yeah, absolutely. All right. And the, this will be recorded. So for those of you that want to come back and listen again, they can. And please get Katie's book. We're so excited to have you, Katie. Thank you. 
All right, so I'm going to go ahead and share the agenda really quickly and just get everyone kind of back into speed here with uh, what we're what we have for the rest of the day. So we just had Katie. Thank you so much. We're going to have Cecilia Ambrose uh, after a little bit of a break here. Jessica Bantam will be joining us at 10. It's a specific time. We are going to take a lunch break. I do believe in burnout as a real thing. So we are going to take breaks throughout the day. So we're going to be taking a break here um, between um, 11 and 11.45 Pacific time. Then we'll come back and we'll have Elizabeth Banker at 12. Uh, and then we'll have a panel discussion with Marie, Eric, Ankit, Laboria, and Nick. We're so excited to have them as well. And then our last um, keynote speaker, Marty Kagan and Olivia Keys will be joining us at two. And then at three o'clock, we're gonna have our networking mixer. Throughout the morning, we'll also have a, a raffle. We're gonna be giving away Katie's book and some other um, fun promotional materials and prizes. And then we'll have a, a giveaway in the afternoon. And then we'll also have a giveaway or raffle at the end during the mixer. So please come back and join us. And we'll see you back in about, let's see. 11 minutes. Thanks everyone.